Welcome back, Ty and that guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my great, good pal, Timothy Frank. <laughs> so I, I saw somebody, uh, I think it was on Twitter, said that uh, you always do this long pause before you say my name, and they're certain it's you trying to remember it. <laughs> <laughs> they're like you have this moment where you're like shit what is this fucker's yeah. name yeah that, that's uh um that's you know maybe not 100 percent true so i'm really excited we get to do this time because we had some uh a couple missed calls earlier uh you were getting construction done in your house and somebody cut your wire yeah or Somebody was cutting your wire to murder you in which you've murdered them first and they're buried in your backyard. And so you're not, you're not disclosing it and you're giving the old story. You're like, yeah, it was a construction guy and he accidentally did it, you know, but uh, either way uh, that messed up our last recording. And then I was on um, a little trip with the wife. So we went to uh, the place that we got married and it's been, you know, 10 years. We had a great time. So we had a podcast scheduled. At a certain time, I think we got crossed in our communication, which is not unusual for Ty and I. And uh, so I was ready to go have my computer, everything set up, whatever. And Clint, our producer, the uh, list Nazi, he said to us, uh, I guess, I don't know if your internet wasn't working or whatever, but we had to postpone it. And so I was like, okay, cool. We're not going to shoot today. So then I ate a bunch of mushrooms and uh, was on a spiritual journey. <laughs> and just as I was about to blast off, Ty chimes in. It's like, okay, I'm ready to rock and roll. Let's go shoot. And I thought for a second, there was a part of me that's like, you know what? I'm going to tune the fuck in and let's have a Space Cadet episode where I'm just out of my mind. But uh, I don't even remember. Did I respond? Like, I don't, <laughs> was, I, was I going to, to be a part There's of it? a lost episode, which we will release on the Patreon. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, so now I'm glad that we're finally getting to do this, and I miss you. It's been a, it's been a week and a half, and uh, I know the our our four loyal fans are just dying to to sink their teeth into this tasty episode that we're about to bestow upon them. They're still working on my house, so they may cut the power again. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know what what's funny is uh, like on Instagram or whatever, when people leave a thing, they they they're calling themselves, "Hey, I'm one of the four <laughs> on the thing." So yeah. We love you guys. We love you guys. Just the six of us. And uh, and this is our time. This is our special time. Fuck everybody else. The six of us is all that matters. Yeah. It's it's our it's our little found family. <laughs> our little found family. Maybe if uh, maybe we can all do like a get together over at Ty's house. Uh, a Ty and that guy get together where we do the podcast with our four fans. But does it make sense to actually do the podcast? Because they're there. The guys that the, the, the four people that listen to it. So maybe it so doesn't. I, 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 I recently uh, sent a book to somebody because you're promising people books. Uh, you're you're going to cross. If you're promising people that they can come to my house. One, somebody's almost certain to get shot. So <laughs> and, 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 and two, uh, I, I don't tell anybody where I live. So. Hey, wouldn't that be a, such a tragedy if I, because yes, I do. I am guilty of like just giving away <laughs> Ty stuff and his hard earned books, but wouldn't that be, well, not, I mean, it would be a tragedy is if I, if I was like, okay, and you went a trip to Ty's house, thinking it'd be funny and have a fan show up at your house and you shoot him. And then I would feel really bad about that. And yeah, you know, yeah. And then we, and then we'd be down to three fans cause I would have shot one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I would feel most bad about yeah. is that, is that, you know, we were starting to get some momentum. Yeah. And I shot 25% we were, of the audience. <laughs> you shot 25% of the audience. All right. So today we're doing episode called IFF identify friend or foe, which is a fitting title because throughout the episode, there's a lot of identifying friend or foe. And <laughs> it's almost like we named them on purpose. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's almost like, have you ever heard, like, you know what a theme is? No. Okay. Please, please explain well, to me about themes You guys writing. are, ran <laughs> like, what's crazy to me is, like, how sometimes the title of the episode really ties into the theme throughout the episode. The fact that you guys are stumbling upon this thing, I, I really think it's going to catch on in the world. But uh, Having in the, themes in, the world in your of, writing? Of us writers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. maybe. We'll see. And, I mean, here's the thing. I may not have talent or point of view or even really know how to read or write, but 
I consider myself a writer amongst you and your peers. Yeah. I, you know, I, and I know that you guys look at me as a writer and like, as in a, much the same way you uh, view me as a top tier actor, because my, <laughs> my one cameo scene in season one of the show, I know that you consider me at the level of like a Tom Cruise or a Tom Hanks. Yeah. Uh, it's the same. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm being, yeah. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So let's just get this out of the way. Bobby Draper and Ava Sarala are not out of the woods yet. They escaped the big explosion. They got out of there with Jules Pierre Mao's ship. They're in the Razorback. There's no weapons in the Razorback. The only thing the Razorback can do is haul fucking ass. Yeah. And there's only two people that can fit in that ship. Now, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Aaron Wright has sent one of the UN ships to to clean up his mess. Yeah. And so this UN ship is hot on their tail and is about to blow them the fuck away. Well, Bobby sends a distress signal, the friend of foe distress signal that only Martian ships can hear or communicate with. Is it a coincidence that the Rosinante is in the area? And that because space is a big fucking place. How did that work out that they sent it out? And that, I mean, Holden, you know, Miller wasn't wrong when he's like, you just shit just follows you around. Doesn't it kid? Yeah. I mean, if you track where Holden is going, where they're, where they're taking the Rosinante, Holden is actually, his path is going right past where they are. Now we never like, we never like make a big deal out of that in the show. We don't like show a map to show that they were going past. But within the logic of what we were doing in the writer's room, figuring it out, yeah, they were they were actually headed right past there to, to get from where they were going to where they were going. So it was lucky. It was lucky. Yeah. So the Rosinante or the penis catortis gets the distress signal. And Alex, of course, is like, well, hell yeah, these are my guys. We're going to go get them. And, and uh, Naomi's on, on board with that. But haven't they learned their lesson about answering distress signals? You know, you'd think that they would by this point, but no. It, it, there's something about being in space that, like, once you're in space, the space madness is anytime you hear a distress signal, you feel obligated to go check on it. Because as you and I have discussed, like, nothing good has ever come from checking a distress signal. Like, it's never turned out well. And I've learned this by being a part of the expanse. So now I'm so adverse to distress signals that if my kids are crying in the other room, I'm like, ah, you're not, going you're not in getting there. me motherfuckers. Right. I'm not going in there. Nothing good comes out of this shit. Yeah, you, you know, know are, are, figure it is out. Is there kid. a murderer in there with them? If you go in, you're just going to get yeah. murdered. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not falling for that shit. But anyway, I guess the Rossinante crew are not as seasoned and experienced as Ty and I, yeah. because, um, well, there is a divide within the crew. Holden is like, no, we're not doing this distress call again. You know, we remember what happened last time. Nothing good comes out of this. And I promised that we're going to find this guy's little girl. And Amos is like, yeah, fuck the distress call. We're going to go find uh, May. And we're going to do it for my, my best pal in the whole world, Prax. And Alex is like, whoa, 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 whoa. now we're like, now we're doing, you know, not going to go. We're not going to. We listen. We, we answer all these other stress calls with this, but now because it's one of my guys, like we don't give a shit about it. Like, no, we should go. And it, there's a heated debate between the two. And Naomi's on board with answering this stress call, but Holden gives Prax a vote. And this is one thing that really surprised me in, in watching this is Prax ends up voting to answer this stress call. Now, this is really hard for me to wrap my head around because if Prax's kid's in trouble and if there is a minute chance that she could be alive would he not do everything in his fucking power to get to her yes and that leads to one of my favorite conversations that i've written on the show which is the conversation between you and prax where amos is trying to figure that out amos is trying to understand this and prax basically admits that he's sure that may is dead like as long as he doesn't find her body it's not true yet and so he's trying to delay. He's trying to delay getting to where May is so that he never has that moment where he finds her dead body and is forced to admit that she's dead. And Amos is there saying, you can't give up on her. You like, I, I don't care how much it costs you emotionally. A kid needs somebody who never gives up on them. That, that conversation between the two of them says so much about where he's at emotionally. It says so much about Amos's philosophy in life. You know, the things that he thinks are true about the world. It's I, I, I love that conversation. It was it was a joy to write that conversation. I love that conversation. I love that moment. And finding the motivation for Amos in that scene was not hard because I still, 
even with his logic of why I still cannot wrap my head around if somebody has a child and there's a chance that child's still alive, that they wouldn't be clawing. If I had that distress signal, I'd be like, fuck all of you. We're going straight to IO and we're going to find my little girl. And think of it like, let's say you were standing at a door and on the other side of the door, you're certain is your kid. And you have come to believe that the kid has been murdered, that, you know, they were kidnapped and they were murdered. And I know this is a terrible thing to think about, but, but, yeah, my, it's my, but my point is you don't think when you grab that door handle, there wouldn't be just a moment's hesitation before you open the door. No, especially if there's a possibility, like if there's a time aspect to this right. where, you know, if, you, if, if the fact that, that she might not be a protomolecule monster yet, she might not be like what those things are yet and, and holding out hope. And so, I would be in such a hurry to get there just for that minute chance that she hasn't been changed yet or, or I could eat and against all logic. Even if I had evidence contrary to that, I'm going full speed and fuck everybody. Fuck the distress call. Fuck Alex. Fuck all of you. I'm going to find that little girl. Now, look, this works out because this is Amos's point of view towards Prax. And it was just hard for me to wrap my head around Prax. I would say I would say that you're probably a little unusual in that because I have I have watched people delay and delay and delay getting bad news. Like the, as long as they haven't gotten the bad news yet, it hasn't happened yet. And so I've watched people do it. I've watched people come up with all sorts of excuses why they they you know like look, look at how long a person will delay going to the doctor when they're certain that the doctor is going to give them bad news. Right, but that's long- about them. Uh, no, that's I understand. About I understand. It's different with the yeah, kid. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. Yeah, but yeah. I've I've watched people like delay bad news so long, and I think that's just where Prax is. He's he's just delaying the bad news. He's I think Prax thinks that the minute he discovers May is dead, his life is over, and he's just putting it off a little bit. He's just he's just trying to put it off. But at the same time, Amos calls him on it. Amos says, "I know that that's what you're doing, and you you can't give up on her." And uh, I I like that they have that that difference of opinion on there. I like I like that for once Amos gets to be the voice of reason in an emotional conversation because he's never almost never the voice of calm logic, right? But uh, right. you know he gets to be the calm logical one in that in that situation, which is cool. Yeah. So one of the things that I really like about the Expanse and that I think a, a lot of shows dealing with space are out there in space that have kind of missed is that the whole concept and we've said this over and over in the show but i think this episode highlights it really well and and one of the things that makes it unique and stand out is that we said this you know surviving in space is fucking hard but when you get involved in these space battles so the razorback outrunning the un ship it's killing alvasarala at the same time so Bringing in the aspect of gravity or even the um, G-force, but even the uh, the challenge of that on top of the external challenge of fighting another spaceship or outrunning something. But even when Amos and Prax are locked down in the tool room and Prax forgot to lock the tools up and the tools are flying around, which I think is a it's a really smart scene. It has a lot of great tension in suspense, you don't know what's going to happen, and it's just creative and, and to show this other challenge that's on top of what they're already going through. You know, if you watch Star Trek or Star Wars, you know, when Han Solo throws that throttle back, you know, you just have those black, you know, those blue streaks that come, but they're sitting there having a full-on conversation and, you know, just relax when they're going light speed. And I get it, and that's fun too, And but when you have something gritty and real and is as real as it can be under those circumstances... There's just another layer of suspense and tension and another challenge that people have to go through. And I think The Expanse does a really great job of that. And this episode highlights that with the whole challenge of running fast enough to get away, but also slow enough to keep Avicerella alive. Yeah, and and trying to watch that razor's edge. That is a conversation that we had a lot in the, the early writers room, the first season. Mark and Hawk, who were the guys who wrote the pilot and developed the show... They were feature writers, and they have written some really great features. So uh, this is not this is not a knock on them by any means. But they had sort of a feature mentality when it came to sci-fi. That the first thing you do when you make sci-fi is you get rid of all the inconvenient stuff, right? Like, well, of course you have to have gravity plating because how else are people going to walk around on the ship? And of course you can communicate faster than light because otherwise, how are people going to have real-time conversations when they're on different planets, right? Like there's this tendency to want to just sort of 
throw that stuff away because it's inconvenient for plotting or inconvenient for, for the writing. And we had a lot of conversations about that. And Narain Shankar, our showrunner, he was the one who really was like, these books are popular for a reason. And I think part of the reason is that they do, they don't hand wave that stuff away, that they do engage with it. And I think the interesting st- stuff that comes out of that is worth the price we will pay in having to write in a world with those realities. And eventually Mark and Hawk got on board with that. In fact, at one point, Hawk came to me, he said, he goes, you know, the brilliant thing about light delay is you've solved the cell phone problem. Because when you're writing, you know, when you're writing movies, the problem you always run into is why doesn't somebody with a cell phone just instantly solve this problem, right? It's like, oh no, they've hidden a bomb under the table. Somebody else just picks up a phone and goes, hey, there's a bomb under your table. You should get out of there. Like, how do you solve that? So like you watch movies and it's always like, oh no, there's no cell phone coverage here, right? And it's always bullshit like that to make it work. But with light delay, like you could be like, oh no, they've put a bomb under the table on Mars and I'm on Earth. And if I call them to tell them there's a bomb under the table, they're not going to get that phone call for 15 minutes, right? Because of the light delay. And so this cell phone problem kind of gets solved and you get to have the, the drama. And so things like if you go really fast, if you accelerate really fast, it's pressing down on your body. That's inconvenient to film, but it becomes a mm-hmm. great plot point, like you're saying. Like, yeah, now now we we can use those things for plot. That's yeah, I like that. It's you know, it would be it would be fun to if there was somebody you know in a house and there was a killer within the house and somebody's on the other end of the phone and that's giving them the instructions on how to avoid this killer, this this person that's coming after them. But there's a delay, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like right behind you, and then you're just too late, you know. And then, like, and the instructions are there. Like, the delay definitely adds a really cool extra element to it. I know one of the guys who drove the Mars rover, and uh, one of the things he said is, "You're driving a vehicle that, if you realize there's a problem and you turn left." it's not going to turn left for like 25 minutes. So, so you drive really, really slow because anything that appears that is a problem was a problem 25 minutes ago. So you can't have been going fast enough that you already hit it. Right. Right. And uh, yeah. it's sort of like that. Right. Yeah. What's his name? And I, I met him too. Uh, oh, Bobak. Bobak. Yeah. Yeah. Bobak. Great guy. Uh, it's always good to see him at the space events and everything. This is weird. I know Bobek too, guys. Weird. He knows everybody. Seriously, that dude knows everybody. Right. Like I, I don't right. know how he's he's so connected, but that guy that guy knows how everyone do you, in the world. How do you know Bobek, Clint? I produced a show called The Thrilling Adventure Hour, and he was a frequent audience member and like fan. He would just come every month. Cool. Cool, man. So we get to meet Elizabeth Mitchell. <laughs> this is her uh she plays Anna. Uh, I have so many fond memories of working with her and we were, the show was so lucky to have her and she was so good in that role and definitely impressed everybody. She's was a fan favorite and she just, she did a, you know, just a phenomenal job. And I think Anna is probably one of the purest characters that I've seen on this point. Yeah. uh, Up to the expanse. I think if it was any or a lot of other actors playing that part, it might've annoyed me. You know, the fact that she's like, okay, I'll write this speech, but, you know, you got to feed the, you, you know, help the kids at the orphanage, you know, that kind of thing. Or like a loving wife and mother and, you know, totally in this world. But what's interesting about her is that she is strong and she knows the game and she's the smartest person in the room. And so she can stand up for herself and, and it's not like she's not naive to what's happening. Yeah. And uh, and that that makes her a compelling character, especially when you have somebody the point of view of her walking through a riot and seeing what's going on 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 Earth. And then when she gets up to that high office and she's talking to the secretary general, the secretary general says something at one point. He's like, look, you got to convince them God is on our side. And she said, Abraham Lincoln wished that he was on God's side. It's a reveal of how self-focused. They are and how things are revolving around them to the fact that he wants God to be on his side. Yeah. And fitting to the title, I love how Aaron Wright sees Anna come in who has the secretary general's ear even more than he does. And he does not like yeah. this. And so the constant reading out between the two at the dinner table, that was great TV. Great stuff. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, Elizabeth Mitchell can pull off scenes that, like you said, another actor would just be annoying. She can pull it off because there is this genuineness to her that just flows out of her, right? That just, 
I, I got to spend a fair amount of time with Elizabeth when we were shooting the show. We did some uh, promotional material together. So we wound up spending a whole day. They were shooting promo stuff and like interviews and that kind of stuff. We spent the whole day together. Yeah. And I, and I know that like actors are very careful about when they're dealing with like, writers and producers and directors and that kind of stuff. They have sort of a persona they put on and, and all of that. And I know you can't always trust if an actor acts like they like you, you can't always trust that right. because they're good at pretending. But yeah. there is a genuineness to Elizabeth that it never slipped. Like if it's a mask, and I don't think it is actually, if it's a mask, yeah. that mask never once slipped in the weeks that I knew her. She just, she was just right. warm and genuine. And if she said something, you believed her. Like it never felt like yeah. she was gaming the system. Like me. Like you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't, I, don't, I don't think she's as desperate for work as you are. <laughs> No, but uh, yeah, and so because because of that, when she plays this part, cut that out, Joseph. <laughs> about you being desperate right. for work. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, that's it's too close to home. Stays in. <laughs> <laughs> cut it out, Joseph. Cut the fucking thing out. <laughs> cut it out. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm just agreeing with you that I, I th- there is there is a genuineness to her performance that is also true when she's not performing. That I think it just sort of radiates out of her now walk me through the backstory of the relationship between her and secretary general so she wrote a speech for him or was she his staff writer and wrote many speeches for him she was part of his movement he had a political movement that he had formed he was he was running for public office she was part of that group you know in the same way that when somebody runs for office they collect a bunch of advisors and speech writers and all that kind of stuff and she was one of his speech writers and she wrote the speech that is his most famous speech the one that actually propelled him on to run for secretary general? So she's famous for having written that speech. And so was she always disillusioned by him or was she a true believer and then he let her down? Well, yeah, I mean, it, over the course of this season, you, you hear the rest of that story. And yes, you, we do eventually come to learn in a later episode that that is what happened, that once the movement really got going – he started making decisions that she felt were immoral, unethical decisions and got disillusioned and, and left. But see, the thing about morals and ethics, it's just so hard to get anything done. You know, this always gets in the way of like trying to, you know, to have quick wins and quick successes. You know, people are always like do the right thing and have to treat people well. And, yeah. You know, it, it's kind of pain in the ass. So just discard it, you know. That's what I say. Yeah. I mean, we should all hope for one day we'll live in the libertarian hellscape of like a Somalia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that your space battles are more accurately described as like compared to sea battles yeah. and nautical naval sea battles. But there's a cool dogfight move in this episode where Holden throws out the coordinates to Alex and Alex is like, we can't pull this off. And he goes, do it anyway. And, and it had this really cool where they shoot over and they first they send the missiles out. They take control of the missiles. They shoot it. It blows up. They fly through the debris of the blowed up missiles. They do a flip in the – well, I was about to say the air. There's no air in space. See, I know my fucking physics and science. So he flows over and then they have the guns perfectly on the UN's engine so they don't kill any UN people. And they disable this fucking engine yeah. and they save the day like they've done many, many times before. And then the closing image, which is for all you beginning writers, you know, they say you focus on the opening image and the closing image. And this closing image happened to be really great with Bobby Japer walking in and Avastarala was lying in her arms and, well, not lying. It was weightless. See, space, science. And she says, help her when there's blood running out of her nose. Great closing image. But in honor of that phenomenal dogfight scene, unless I'm jumping ahead and you want to comment on it. Uh, in honor of that, I was thinking our top five list would be either our top five movies that have a lot of dogfighting in it or our top five dogfights in movies. Mm. Um, what do you think? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of movies that are not about dogfighting that have a great dogfight in them. So, Give an example. I think that the, the dogfight between the two helicopters at the end of the, the Mission Impossible movie is a pretty fucking spectacular dogfight, and it's not a dogfighting movie. So should we do dogfight scenes? Then? I think so. I think scenes, yeah. Okay. All right. So that's first on our list. Now, when Bruce Willis jumps off 
the building and he's in the air for a second. Yeah. Does that count as a dog? Yeah. Scene? Well, because the helicopter, <laughs> the helicopter is attacking, right? Uh, he, he briefly becomes airborne and then uses the bomb to blow the helicopter up. That is a dog fight. Yeah. And there's an explosion. Yeah, and there's an explosion. And they're in the air. Yeah. And dogfight is just about aerial tactics, air, right? Yeah, so it doesn't, combat. you don't yeah. have to be aerial combat. Yep. So, I'm going to stop this show. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Get back on track. <laughs> so I have a list of movies that I was thinking about. Now, we might have to distinguish between dogfighting scenes and dogfight Well, just movies. pick the best scene from those movies, right? That's why I love you, bro. <laughs> you always come in in the clutch and you have just... So smart, I, so you clever. Mean I always think of the most obvious thing. Yes, I'm very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's your that's your uh, superpower. My gift is I can think um, of obvious stuff. So obviously, number one. Well, besides besides Die Hard, what what would you guess that I would have on the the top? I'm going to guess, knowing what I know about you, that number one for you is going to be Top Gun. You're goddamn right, it's yeah. Top Gun. I'm not going to sit here and blow sunshine up your ass. <laughs> that spin was hell. <laughs> it would have shook me up. Uh yeah, Lieutenant Pete Pete Mitchell and uh Top Gun. I remember when I saw and I think we've even talked about it on this podcast, but I remember when I saw Top Gun for the first time, I was like, I have never seen any kind of aerial combat yeah. or just the sexiness of the jets on the flight deck. The F fourteen Tomcat is still the sexiest jet they've ever made. Oh, it's so badass. It's so sexy. And and, and the and the, the whole the wings that sweep back when it's going fast and, uh, and I mean just like everything about that jet is with, just with, with Kenny pure with sex. Kenny Loggins just fucking blasting oh, yeah. in the background. Yeah. It just it just fires on all cylinders, and, and, man. And the thing is the F fourteen was insanely fast. Like the Hornets now, I mean they're fine jets or whatever, but they're like half the speed of an F fourteen. The F fourteen's still the fastest thing to ever come off an aircraft carrier. And it's like 30 years old now. Also, what blew my mind, too, is, uh, you know, I, I had the idea. Uh, I ended up spending four years of my life on a flight deck. But this movie was the first time that I, like, that I thought about how difficult it is to take off and land on a moving, floating, oh, yeah. waving uh, airport. And also, the, just the massive coordination of everybody in, uh, involved. And even the yellow shirts, like they were sexy. Just you know, even the guys that yeah. were directing and landing the planes were bad motherfuckers. And so, now, now let me ask you real quick on on your uh, on your six inches. Y yes, no, no, I know. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> on your uh, carrier, it, it doesn't have um, arresting cables, right? No, yeah. no, I was on. Uh, you know, the only actually the only jet we had on on, you uh, had Harriers, on my right? on yeah it was a Harrier, yeah. and then we were mainly like Cobras. Uh, H sixties, forty threes, CH forty sixes, the Chinooks. Yeah, but uh, so you also you also didn't have a catapult. We did not have a catapult. That's probably why I still have all my legs. <laughs> uh, because if we did, I know I would have wandered into a catapult at some point. Yeah. So just you know, Top Gun on it just fired on so many different levels. Was it eighty six or eighty seven? I was in high school, so it, it had to be yeah, the mid eighties. It was eighty seven. It was like when Cruz was just. This is the one that kind of took him over the top. This is the one that put him in that stratosphere of uh, like where I am now, like that stratosphere yeah. of just you know, just box office bang and uh, you know the rock and roll. The it's just it it was it was such a great movie, and I think also too when you go back and watch it. The, the, a lot of the aerial shit still hand, stands up. Yeah. Well, because it, it was all real. It was models. It wasn't like uh, CGI. It was they filmed real planes or they filmed really detailed models. Except for the inverted bird thing. That 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 doesn't hold up. That kind of looks kind of cheesy on there. <laughs> and the, what is it? The MiG-28? The MiG-28 is a fictional, fictional jet. That doesn't really exist. I'm trying to remember what was the, what is the MiG-28. It's some other jet that they painted. Yeah, um, it, was a, it was a training jet. Oh, okay. It's a yeah. U.S. training yeah. jet, and then they turned it into the the MiG twenty eight, so that they didn't have to act, get actual MiGs. Did you ever see Hell's Angels? Yeah, number two on my list. Yeah, yeah. The, so the, the, the um uh, Howard Hughes movie. Yeah, yeah. the Howard Hughes yeah. movie. That movie blows my fucking mind. I mean, I think what like three people died doing that movie. They they, they but, were actually dogfighting. I mean, they weren't shooting real bullets at each other, but they, like the planes were actually dogfighting each other, and they just had dudes with cameras in them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just had to have a, a guy that had the money and the supply for those planes and was passionate enough about aviation, yeah. but and people that are willing to risk their lives. I mean, they were risking their lives, and it's one of the most thrilling 
uh, aerial dogfight movies I've ever seen. The story's, you know, sappy and melodramatic, but the dogfight is just insane. So that's number two on my list. Number three, Red Baron. Got a little, got to get a World War One in there. Yeah. Number four, Tora Tora Tora, which is really interesting because it's a movie about Pearl Harbor, and one of the main advisors they had on the movie was an actual guy who was one of the planners of Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Now you were saying something before the podcast, and I kind of missed it. How did they receive the Tor 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 when it came out? It was not successful when it first came out, and it got a lot of backlash. There was a lot of, I mean, you, you got to think, I mean, it was only 25 years after Pearl Harbor that that movie came out, and guys who had fought in the Pacific were watching this movie. They're like middle-aged businessmen now, and they're watching this movie, and they're watching a movie where... And I, th- I think well, it's the right thing. Were they, they were all businessmen? No, but I'm just... Some, I'm of, just, I'm, some of them weren't writers? No, or, none of them were no, writers. What if somebody all, wanted to be a chef? No, no <laughs> chefs. Nobody, singers? Any singers? Anymore? Nobody who fought yeah. in the Pacific ever became anything other than a businessman. Businessman? <laughs> <laughs> I just picture like across the country, yeah. just guys with suit and ties. Oh, and briefcases. Like, with briefcases. Yeah. Like, sitting in, sitting the, in the theater with their briefcase. All businessmen. But they were, you know, I mean, yeah. they were like, how dare you give the Japanese any sympathetic point of view in this movie. They attacked us. They were the bad guys. And I, while I understand that reaction, I also think that Tora 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 is actually a pretty great movie. And I think part of what makes it great is that it does show both sides. It does paint the Japanese as humans, not as like faceless monsters attacking America, but as humans who fought and died for their country the same way, you know, our guys fought and died for theirs. That doesn't mean the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor wasn't a pretty shitty thing to do. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, if you read about what was happening at the time, you, you kind of understand what their point was. I understand why they did the things that they did. I think they were shitty and they shouldn't have done them, but I, I do sort of understand. And I think it's, I think mm. it's a good movie. So uh, the next one I want to talk about is uh, I loved Star Wars. I remember I had it recorded off the VCR. Like, oh, it was a, they did a special one night on the TV, and that's how I saw it. And I would watch it over and over and over and over. I saw Star Wars at Hollywood Bowl with the actual live orchestra that actually did the music while they saw it. And it was, it was an incredible viewing experience. But I still remembered all the commercial breaks because I watched that tape so many times. So I love Star Wars. I'm a fanatic about Star Wars, big Star Wars fan. But after Top Gun came out and I went back and watched Star Wars, I could not. The aerial battle, or aerial, but the, the space battles were just not the same when you had that high octane. And I went back, and, the, and I, I was never the same with Star Wars, their dogfights. Now, I know George Lucas was a big, you know, World War II. Uh, he loved dogfights and aerial battles, so he took a lot of his inspiration and did that in space. But you just can't compete with the, the muscle of real F-14s just firing across the sky. But I, I have to, you know, be, out of respect to the movie, and, and uh, there's some really cool dogfight stuff, especially when they um, blew up the Death Star. But what do you think about it? Uh, I mean, I loved Star Wars, too. I saw it when I was a kid. It, you know, any any kid who saw Star Wars, it, when you're that right age, it, it changes your brain. It, like, it's aimed right at that, that 10-year-old brain, man. I, I think it's, you're looking at it now, it's kind of quaint, you know? Yeah. It doesn't hold up as well, but it, I mean, I, my, I still remember the 10-year-old version of me watching it. It was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. Yeah. Ah. Uh. Loved it. Breck was telling me a story when he was in film school. They watched Star Wars without sound. Yeah. Or not I me. Mean, they watch it without the uh, the the soundtrack, without the voiceover. And he's like, dude, it is not the same movie. Yeah. It is not. Um, The Eternal Zero, Memphis Bell. Did you ever see The Great Waldo Pepper? Yeah, of course. So you remember the end when Redford and that guy and they're doing the dog fight and it ends up turning? That was incredible. And that was directed by George Roy Hill, who was a pilot and an aviation enthusiast. So they really went. I mean, I was that's very impressive uh, what they pulled off with that. Number nine. Did you ever see the? It's called Skycrawlers. You ever see it's like a cartoon? No. Um, there's some really incredible uh, aviation stuff in that. Iron Eagle, man. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is the silliest movie but my the silliest so my, movie. I, I i think i think it's probably out of all these movies it's probably the most believable when you say <laughs> oh yeah for sure it's the most believable by far most, yeah <laughs> so in high school uh my buddy that i used to hang out with all the time he was he was older than me and he was a he was an amateur pilot so uh-huh. we you know we'd rent cessnas and stuff and go fly and he had actually gone to, um, he actually wound up going to the United Airlines school, learning, learned how to fly 727s and stuff. But uh, when that movie, when Iron Eagle came out, 
we went and saw that together because we were both into flying stuff. And uh, that stupid movie, we must have seen that movie at the theater like three times. <laughs> it, it's so fucking dumb, but it's such a it's such a power fantasy that like you steal an F sixteen and then you're just like fucking dudes up over you know like over in the Middle East. Was it an F sixteen? Yeah, it was an F sixteen. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. And then uh, and Louis Gossip Jr. Yeah. Uh, it, man, yeah, it was. You're right. So it is such a power it's fantasy. So dumb, but I I watched that in the theater probably three times. Yeah, and I love how he puts in his rock and roll tape. Oh, he's yeah. like, "All right, let's go," and he puts <laughs> in his tape as he's going. Like he doesn't even do. It. What was the premise again? He had to go save his dad. Yeah, he went there his and like dad saved had his been, dad. Like, captured. And so they were going to steal two F-16s, which, by the way, apparently that's super easy to do, like to just steal right. F-16s. And not only do they steal them, but somehow they convince people to do mid-air refueling. Like, yeah, like apparently How do they do that. Apparently, the Air Force just has jets, mid-air refueling jets that will just refuel anybody. Right. Like, uh, they, you don't even have to have like orders or anything, you know, like just pull up right. and like, hey, can I have some gas? Oh, the 80s. Why do I love you so much? You know, what's funny is uh, Tarantino, I was listening to an interview that he was doing. I just read his uh, his book, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and I was kind of going through and, and uh, listening to interviews that he did. But he was doing these, and he was talking about movies and the evolution of movies going all the way back to the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and how it was like at a high point in the 60s and 70s. And he just shits all over the 80s, man. Just shits all over the 80s. And, I'm, and it hurt. And I totally... It, 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 but then you listen, you're like, ah, he does got a point. But the reality is, though, 80s movies were about magic and having a good time. And it wasn't like, it's like, don't overthink it. Don't, <laughs> don't ever, don't worry about acting. Don't worry about like, a, you know, just go in there and fucking do it, man. Let's like, we'll have, how about we have two guys, two buddies that uh, are lonely and they're ostracized at school and they're big nerds. And uh, let's have them make a girl and that girl is going to be a supermodel and then they're going to find their strength and their confidence and their self-worth by being around the supermodel. And I mean, and, and they, also, they make somehow, weird science. Somehow the supermodel has magical powers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, somehow. Yeah, it, what, you know what? I have never stopped to question that. I have never thought that through. Like she has fucking powers. She has fucking magical she, powers. She has mad. She can make missiles come through the roof. She can make people forget who you. She, what, she, she turned Chet into living poop. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I just totally accepted all of that. Yeah. I have never thought that through. Like, how? Where does she get the powers? Is she, did they like she summon an angel <laughs> in the stratosphere? <laughs> she has powers, and what is she? Uh, she's created by a computer out of a Barbie doll, but has magic powers. I don't know. <laughs> that blows my mind. I'm now thinking about this for the first time. Like I've always just accepted it and I love it. And it's, and now I'm trying to figure like, sorry for fans. I, she has magic powers. Dude, I, she I feel like, Shannon I feel like I just put you into vapor lock. You did. You just, <laughs> you just like exploded my brain, man. I love that movie. I love it so much. But yeah, you're, you're right. Like no, nobody. You two douchebags couldn't get laid in the morgue. <laughs> No, no, How about a no nice way, greasy no pork sandwich oh on a dirty ass tray. I, I knew that one was coming. Cause... For God's sakes, would you cover yourself? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, nobody nobody wrote a scene that explains why she has magic powers. Nobody cared. Like yeah. there's no there's yeah. no scene to explain that. It just happens. Yeah. We should write some fan fiction about who she is. Is she an a, an angel in the stratosphere or is she a magician? <laughs> like where where did, how did Is she a robot? What the fuck? Is she a robot? Like where does she get powers from? Yeah. That doesn't make, you know, and then everything uh and uh anyway, Firebirds, Red Tails, Flyboys, which is a terrible movie. It's a terrible movie. Pearl Harbor, which is a terrible movie. Uh Midway, which is not a terrible movie. What was that movie with Clint Eastwood and he steals that jet? Firefox, man. Firefox. Firefox is Firefox. great. Like it doesn't hold up yeah. at all. But I, I used to watch that movie a lot when I was when I was a kid. When it like when it yeah. first came out, I fucking loved that movie. I loved Firefox. Yeah. What about that movie with uh, Jaws? What's his name? Roy Schreider. Oh, the helicopter one, Blue Thunder. Yeah, Blue Thunder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a badass movie. I mean, the other one, um, the other one that's not really a dogfight movie, but the. The scene where the F-14s shoot down the Japanese Zeros in uh, Final Countdown is pretty great. Oh, yeah. 
That's bad. When you get, when you get to yeah. see like modern fighter jets going up against these like World War II planes. And, right. Yeah. So I say number one is Top Gun. I would say number two is Hell's Angels just because it's so ahead it's of its time and so mind blowing. Yeah. It is spectacular. Number three is well, Red Baron. I mean, we got like the World War One was cool because seeing uh, seeing the World War One airplanes and there's some really spectacular stuff in that. So we can give it that number three. Do we got? Do we put Star Wars on there just because just out of respect and we love it? I would not put Star Wars on a list of best dogfighting movies. I would put it on. I would put it on many other lists, but dogfighting, I would not. What about the Great Waldo Pepper? Uh, we got a lot of World War One stuff on the list right now. What about Iron Eagle? <laughs> There's some cool dog fights in it. Yeah, I guess. What about Firebirds? Um, I hate that movie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what about Independence Day? Uh, you know what? The the dog fighting scenes in Independence Day are a lot of fun. It's it's you know Independence Day gets trashed nowadays because it's you know it doesn't hold up particularly well and it's pretty silly. But we all loved it when it first came out. When that movie came yeah, out, we I all it- loved it. And the dogfighting scenes are pretty good. I thought it was a good time. Yeah. And I thought, it would, I thought it was a great idea to have, like, modern airplanes going against spaceships. Yeah. Uh, jet Fighter jets going against spaceships. So we'll throw that in there. All right, what's number five? Oh, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what I would put Independence Day at number four. I mean, like, I'm, I'm just saying it was fun. But I, I'm not saying it's, like, the great dogfight with Midway. You know, here's the thing is, I don't think Midway is a great movie, mm-hmm. but I think it is maybe the most historically accurate depiction of those events, and it is stunningly well filmed. So I, I would put Midway on there. Like the, the, scene, the, the scene where they're actually fighting the Battle of Midway, where the, the dive bombers are trying to hit those four uh, Japanese carriers, is incredibly well done, and it's incredibly accurate. Like... Like, I've studied those battles. I read up on World War II stuff constantly and watch every documentary on World War II stuff. And I'm surprised by the details they got right in that movie. Like, shit that you didn't have to do because it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter for, like, Mm -hmm. the movie version. They still were getting details right that were amazing. And you know what's an interesting movie is The Eternal Zero, where it's it's from the point of view of the kamikaze pilots. Yeah. I think that could be number five because it's, it's a point of view we don't ever see, but it's also an aerial combat that's kind of... You know, they're actually dive bombing their actual planes in the ships. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that would be a good number five. You know, for for our four listeners, uh, one idea that we thought would be fun because Ty's internet went out of the right before our podcast <laughs> when it got cut when he's doing construction. But we thought about movies or movie scenes when power goes out at the wrong time. So it'd be cool to hear some of your guys' ideas. And we do have a winner. Uh, for the Amos being out all night, uh, what happened? Ty and I did not read it. We do not read these things. We're, you know, legally, we're not supposed to, but the producers did. So, and we do have a winner, but we're reaching out to make sure it's okay for that person to be able to announce them on the podcast. That's what, that's what's. Oh, so we're not saying their name until we get their permission to say their name. Yeah. Uh, that's, we're not that's saying smart. their name until we get Yeah. And I've already, yeah. I've already arranged with my assistant to get a book sent over to them since you're giving my stuff away. So, <laughs> so, so. We actually are doing the thing that Wes said we were going to do. I, I don't want to make Wes a liar. You're going to take it out of my face. Yeah, I'm I'm like, what book. is this deducting for all these <laughs> books? You know, And you're going to upcharge them because you sign it? Awesome, awesome. Uh, well, thank you guys for hanging out. I look forward to hearing your ideas about when power goes off at the wrong time. And, you know, one of these days we'll do a get together, just the six of us over at Ty's house. Uh, as soon as I get his address, he's he's stingy with that thing. Great. Like and subscribe. Do all the things. Support us or not. We're here for you anyway. Put, we're putting love and goodness out of the universe. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.